Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the midweek service here at Bible Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you have joined us this evening. Would you now join with me in a word of prayer? Our Father, we come to you right now and ask your hand of blessing upon this service tonight. May you use the music to stir our hearts. May you use the teaching of your word, Father, to help us. And might we apply it to our daily living. In Jesus' name, amen. Right now, I'm going to turn things over to Brother Ted Williams. He's going to come with some updates and some announcements for you. Good evening and welcome. First, on behalf of Pastor Joel and the entire church staff, we are so looking forward to when God establishes us back on our regular services here on campus at Bible Baptist Church. Until then, let's all be sure to be logging on Sunday morning at 11 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and then on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., for the sermons that pastors put together for us. While you're there, be sure to look for and log on all the additional video uh, content that pastors put on there just for you. In addition, I know that each and every one of us will want to be faithful with our tithe. For our convenience, the church has put on the website there a push pay app. You can just click on that and take care of that. Now, if you prefer, just mail in your tithe at a church office. That'd be fine. And if you feel more comfortable, call us, and we'd actually send out a staff member to help you with that if so necessary. Now, lastly, Easter Sunday is coming up fast. It's April 12th, right around the corner, and pastor has asked us to be on the lookout. That's right, during the next few weeks, the church will be posting some very exciting announcements online regarding our upcoming Easter Sunday services. Until then, thank you very much. As we begin our Bible study this evening, I would like to bring our church family to prayer tonight. Just ask you to be in prayer as would be expected with a church our size and the many people that all of us know. I've begun to hear over the last several days of folks within the church family who have 
family members of their own in other places, or friends, or co-workers, folks that they know who have come down with uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, I ask you to pray for those families. Some of them I know, some of them I don't, but I ask you to pray for members in our church who have family, loved ones, friends who are dealing with this. I'm glad to report, as of the time of preparing this, uh, there are none within our church family who have uh, that we know of have tested positive. We glad, we're glad for that. We ask you to continue praying. I also ask you to pray for our church family in this. Every day, it seems my list on my iPad is growing of folks that I'm praying for within our church family who are dealing with job losses or loss of hours at their work as uh, sadly would be expected at a time like this. And I ask of you, if you would take some time this evening and throughout the week, if you would be in prayer for our church family. Please take your Bible tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when you find it, we're going to look up verse number 57 and 58, the very last two verses of this great chapter. Now, while you're turning in your Bible, many of you will know 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter, and then 1 Corinthians 15, I'll give you a second to think about it, do you remember what 1 Corinthians 15 is known as? Well... It's known as the great chapter on the resurrection, and tonight we'll be hearing more about the power of the resurrection and the abundant Christian life uh, that we all have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 57 and 58, the Bible there says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our Father, we come to you right now and ask that you would bless this time of study in your word, that you would strengthen uh, the teacher, the pastor here as I preach your word, and that, Father, that you would strengthen us as we hear your word, that we might apply it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to look, first of all, verse number 57. There's a word that I love. The word is victory. Often in the Greek language, the word for victory is used, and it's actually something you might have on your feet. Some of you might look down, and you'll see a swoosh on your foot. That Greek word for that swoosh is nike, or we would call it nike. That is the Greek word for victory. It's a fun little reminder for you every time that you want to think about the word victory. You might just look at the shoes that you have on or the shirt that you're wearing. It has that symbol on it, and you can think of victory. But I want to speak to you tonight of a greater victory that we can have in our lives than running a race or playing a game. I want us to think about victory in the Christian life. And we are in a peculiar place. In fact, that's the subject of this series of lessons last week dealing with stress, this week on some commitments of the victorious Christian, especially in a peculiar place. As we have said, you have heard, this is a strange time. This is a unique place. And I want Wednesday nights for the next several weeks to be a place, an oasis, so to speak, in the desert where we step apart. And as Christians, we look to God's Word for strength in our everyday living in a peculiar time like this is. Now, I would say, first of all, about victory, I'm just going to give you some victory thoughts, so to speak. Number one, everybody wants to be victorious in the Christian life. I don't know of anybody who would at least say that they want to live a defeated Christian life. Everybody, everybody wants to be victorious, but along with that, few are willing to pay the price for victory. You think they just mentioned the other day that they're going to be having the 2020 Olympics in 2021. They gave the start date, I believe, as July the 23rd. And those athletes are now waiting a year. They get an extra year to train, to prepare, but they have an extra year to wait. And the difference often in many of those races is, is even more than just a split second. It's just a, almost an eyelash difference between the one who wins the gold medal and the one who gets the silver, or the one who at least gets on the medal stand, and the one who places fourth and fifth and sixth. And the difference might be, in many cases, that everybody wanted, everybody wanted to be victorious, but listen now, few were willing to pay the price for victory. 
Now, I'm glad to report something to you. Jesus Christ, in our lives, he already paid all the price for our eternal victory. Did you catch there in verse number 57? It says in there, but he giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are already victorious if we know the Lord Jesus Christ. A week and a half from now, we have Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate the victory that is ours in Christ. The victory is already ours if we are a believer. The problem is, do we live? Do we walk? Do we, do we breathe? Do we act out in that victory on a daily basis? We want to be victorious, but are we willing to pay the price? Secondly, I would tell you this, because people don't well, want to pay the price you have to add number two. Victory doesn't just happen. It's not a matter of I woke up and decided to have victory and there it is. Victory doesn't just happen. No, number three about victory. The road to victory is challenging. The gold medal for that Olympian next year wouldn't be sweet if it wasn't a challenge. Wouldn't be sweet if there wasn't an opponent to defeat. Wouldn't be sweet if there weren't many, many days and weeks and months where they gave themselves completely for the victory and gaining the victory. The road to victory is challenging. I would also say this, number four, the, the way of victory is worth the fight. The way of victory is worth the fight. Do you know somebody whom you would say they have lived, and they've lived many years, a what you would call a victorious Christian life. Have you ever asked them, is it worth it? If you did, I would guarantee you they would look at you and they would say it was worth every mile. Not every mile was enjoyable. Not every mile was something that we necessarily liked. Not every mile was easy, but it was worth every mile. It was worth every moment. I want to come back to the end of my life and look back this direction and say it was worth every moment. I don't want to go to the end of my life and say, I wish I had. Don't have that kind of life. You have victory in Christ. Let's live by victory. Because here's number five truth as we begin about victory. Victory is sweet. There is a vast world of difference between the one who lives in victory and the one who lives in defeat. While we've had maybe a little extra time, I've had the chance to watch a documentary on baseball. Now, that might bore some of you to tears. I've been watching it. I like history and I like baseball. It's a perfect mesh for me. And I watched one moment, one moment, where a team came down to the End of the ninth inning, there were two outs and they were down. Game seven of the World Series. And in that moment, hope was still alive for the player at the plate. And the ball was pitched and the bat was swung and the ball went up into the air and the center fielder caught the ball. And in that moment, all the intensity of the pursuit was gone. In that moment, all the drive to win was gone. Why? The final out had been recorded. And one team ran to the center of the infield near the pitcher's mound, and they piled on each other, and they celebrated. The other team, most of them were in the dugout because their team was at the bat. And you just saw in a moment where they were clinging to what little hope they had, but when the ball went into the glove and it was all over, you saw the sadness on the face. The pursuit of that season was over. One team was celebrating and one team was in sadness. It was over just like that. I would tell you, the winning team would look and say, it was sweet. There's just a different look about the person who is victorious. Now, all those things are good statements, but I would tell you this, victory, victory. You, you put a big ribbon, a bow, all around those statements I made about victory. Victory requires commitment. The only way, whether it's an athlete, a businessman, someone in the sciences, somebody in the arts, or even walking and living daily in the Christian life, victory requires a commitment. And that's the commitment I want to talk to you about tonight. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, I love the fact he went more by general than he did by president, but he was known for this statement, there are no victories at discount prices. You think of the one who gave us the victory that we have, the Lord Jesus Christ. There was no discount price on what he paid for us. 
I know many of you are looking forward to the day that you'll see it all in full. There's a beautiful baptistry behind me. I've had several people mention how nice it looks. Right above that baptistry is the cross. That cross is a picture of the price that Jesus paid. I would add this for just a moment. The cross is really not the greatest symbol of Christianity. Oh, it's an important one. The greatest symbol of the Christianity that we have, true biblical Christianity, is an empty tomb. And we're going to celebrate that here together in a few days. But when Christ died on that cross... And then he was buried when he had shed his blood for us, his precious, spotless blood. And he was buried. He had died. Three days later, he rose. Remember, 1 Corinthians 15 is the chapter on the resurrection. That's why it says, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But Christ went all the way. Now, to live in that victory is going to take some commitments in our life, and I want us to look at those commitments by looking together at verse number 58. Verse number 58, just word by word for just a moment, and then we're going to make some important application, three parts of application in our lives. Look with me, first word at verse number 58. Those of you that know me, you know I love this word. I love it. The first word of verse 58, therefore. Oh, I love therefore. One of my spiritual gifts is teaching. And in that spiritual giftedness, I think everyone with that spiritual gifts loves therefore. You know why? Therefore is a connector. It's like a bridge. And those of us that love to get in and study the Word of God, we like words like that. Hence and wherefore and therefore. Words that we might just pass over, but oh, they're so important. And you would say, Pastor, why is that word therefore so important. Well, therefore is therefore for what came before. And it teaches us what came before to help us with what's going to come after. Therefore, if you would have your Bible and you, and you take notes, you want to draw a little arrow to above therefore and below therefore. It makes a bridge that we can learn from. What is that therefore, therefore? Well, it's therefore, verses 1 through 57. Now, I'm not going to take the time to go through all of that tonight. You can read it. But when you begin in verses 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, it tells us the story of the gospel. You hear the word gospel and you say, what exactly does it mean? Verses 3 and 4, it's right there for you. It talks about how Christ died was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Then after that, it goes through all of those who were witnesses, including being seen of upwards of 500 people at one time, saw the Lord Jesus Christ and all the others who had seen him. And it's evidence of the resurrection. Then you go a little bit further in the next several verses down through about verse number 19 will teach us this. It's great truth says, if there's not a resurrection, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then everything that we're doing is pointless. Living the Christian life is pointless. Singing a song of praise to the Lord is pointless. Walking with God is pointless. To preach the word of God is pointless. To have hope in Christ is pointless. If there's no resurrection, but think of these words in verse number 20. But now is Christ risen. We don't have to wonder if there is or if there would be. It is a true fact. Our Savior rose. And so that therefore is therefore, verse number 20, now is Christ risen and become the first fruits of them that slept and down through the rest of the chapter. But think with me, look with me at verse number 55, if you would. Uh, verse number 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? Christ is risen, death is defeated. Great preacher of years gone by, a man by the name of Donald Gray Barnhouse, his first wife passed away when his children were still young. They had gone to the funeral that day, and Mr. Barnhouse was wondering, how do I explain to my young children what happened to their mama? Some of you who are watching this, you've been down that road. You've had to come up with the right words to say. And you understand it's very different to live it than it is to talk about it. And you understand exactly how Mr. Barnhouse would have felt. So Bar Donald Gray Barnhouse was driving home from the funeral wondering how do I, he could see the, the concerned look in the eyes of his children. Everything they could tell, he could tell was just spinning their worlds upside down. Till as they were driving, a truck passed them. 
And when the truck passed them, he said to the children, he said, children, he said, would you rather be hit by the truck or would you rather be hit by the shadow of the truck that went by us? And they said, well, daddy, we'd rather be hit by the shadow. And they, he said, children, that's like what happened to your mama. Oh, she died from this life, but the Bible calls it just a shadow. Her victory is in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's true of all of us who are born again children of God. If you're watching this tonight and you don't know Christ, would you come to him today for the forgiveness of your sins? He paid it all. I spoke to you of what the gospel is and explained the resurrection to you. You can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. You could contact us here at the church and we would love to talk to you more. If you know Christ, if you know him, death is defeated. You drive by the cemetery that's all along the road there on the I-15, and every one of those graves has two categories of people, those who know Christ and those who didn't. At the end of this life, that's what really matters. Those who know Christ, they're not really there. It just holds the house, the body that they lived in. You see what you see in me in flesh and bone? This isn't the real me. The real me is on the inside. And either I'm dead in my trespasses and sins or I'm alive in Christ. And being of the truth that I'm alive in Christ, death has been defeated. Would you look a little further with me? Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is is the law and then that great verse verse 57 that speaks of the victory we have in Jesus Christ therefore Christ is risen therefore death is defeated therefore the victory is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ now look with me the next section there in verse 58 notice with me in your Bible it says therefore my beloved brethren he's speaking to Christians it says be ye steadfast I like that word steadfast. It's the kind of Christian I want to be. The word said steadfast, if I could, we're, we're not, I'd go out of range of the camera here, but yeah, the, you know the pews are behind me. Many of you do, or I could put a chair here. If I were to set a chair down and sit down, I would be being steadfast according to that word. It means to be seated or to be settled. Now I'm settled in what? I'm settled in my trust. Why? Therefore, because of the victory I have in Christ. But I'm also, watch this, settled in my confidence. I'm settled in my confidence. Now, there, be ye steadfast, it made me think of this one place. It was called the Ice Palace in Leadville, Colorado in the winter of 1896. Leadville, Colorado was a leading mining town in the mid-1800s, but it had since lost its, its strength and viability in that way, and the town was running out of money. They had a cold winter and decided with a cold winter, we'll build an ice palace and tourists will come and they'll walk around and be oohed and awed by this ice palace. I mean, this thing was amazing. They used 5,000 tons of ice. That's a lot of ice. Multiply 5,000 by 2,000. That's a lot of moisture, a lot of ice. Then this, this place was 58,000 square feet. It was, no, it was no small place. Inside of it, they had a 180-foot skating rink. They had places for people to go. They had things and entertainment for them to enjoy. And the restaurant was there. And it was a wonderful place. And people came from miles around to see it. And all oh, people enjoyed it. But there's one big problem. One big problem. Ice melts and days get warmer. And late February came, early March came, and they had an early spring. And all that tonnage of ice began to melt. Now, it took a while. They kept the skating rink open for a while. Things were okay for a while. But you're not going to have an ice palace in June ice is going to melt. They put their confidence in a place for a little time, and then it's going to vanish away. In this life, we can put our confidence in money. We can put our confidence in a career. We can put our confidence in things, or we can put our confidence in God. I will tell you, you take the Lord every day. We rest. We're steadfast. And then the next word, steadfast, then the next word is unmovable. 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 Here's what it is. It emphasizes steadfast. To be steadfast, unmovable, means settled, and I'm not going anywhere. 
settled, and it's not going to change. Settled, and I'm staying here. That's the kind of Christian we need. That's the kind of Christian the world needs to see in this day to day. One who is there, one who is there and not going anywhere, steadfast, unmovable. But for our sakes, let's begin to apply this now. It says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That word abound means that God will supply enough, but I would tell you it means even more than that. Because the word abound, you look it up, it actually means to super abound. It means to abound and then go above and beyond, to go over. Whenever, and I've, I've given this illustration on this word for many years. I have young people who have grown up in the church and they'll talk about, they go to a restaurant and they think of this when they get a refill. I love it when I go to a restaurant and get a refill and I don't have to ask the waiter or the waitress to get that refill for me. I just set it out there on the edge and they come by and they get it and they refill that drink, they remember. And they come back and they say, oh, I filled it a little bit too high. It might spill over a little bit. Be careful, I'm sorry. I tell them all the time, don't, don't apologize for that. That just means I get a little bit extra on the top. You know, that's kind of like that word abound there. The word abound means to super abound. It's actually what it means, to go above and beyond. Now, it means something. God has supplied far more than we would ever need in this life. Our God is not a just enough God. Our God gives exceedingly abundantly above all that we would ask or think when we trust him. And when he does, we abound we superabound, and the one who walks in victory, their life spills over on others. Now, how's that going to happen? How do we live that way? We have victory. How do we live in it? Well, there are many things I could say regarding confessing our sin and being right with God. And I'm, for our purpose tonight, I'm going to look at it and say that you are tonight. If you're not, get some things. You know there's some sin in your life. Get that right with God. You're not going to abound in the Christian life living in sin. But looking at you and knowing many of you, you're, you're doing what you can to live right before God. But in the Word of God, you want, you want to really abound three things. Number one, we have to abound in the Bible. We have to abound in in the Word of God. And now for just a couple minutes, I want to give you a practical thought or two about abounding in the Word of God. Some of you, not because you've chosen it, you have extra time. Teenagers, you have extra time. Parents, you might have some extra time at home. You're not going out. You know what that is? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We have an advantage right now that we don't often have. Let's not look at all just the bad thing. By the way, it's not going to be in my list. What about family time? We complain we don't get enough time to spend with the family. Well, now that we have that opportunity, are we enjoying the family? Are we playing some more games? Are we actually sitting around the dinner table and enjoying that? But time in the Word of God, I'm going to give you one way to really apply it in your life. We could, I could give you a number of things. It's going to give you one thing. It might spark an idea in your own life. God might convict you about some other area in your Bible reading or study. April has 30 days. 30 days. The four Gospels contain a total of 89 chapters. You divide that up, and with just two tacked on the end, if you averaged three chapters a day, you could read the four Gospels all in the month of April. Maybe you would take that challenge on. Can I ask you something? Would you have wasted any time if you did that? Do you think you might grow? Do you think it might help you in that abundant, committed Christian life? So number one, the Bible. Number two is prayer. And all I would say about this in your life with that is with prayer, be specific. Don't pray in generalities. In fact, before we were beginning here today, I was looking, and some of you can visualize it, the missionary letters on the back. You know, I don't pray for all the missionaries in the world because I shouldn't pray for all the missionaries in the world. Not all the missionaries are giving the gospel of Jesus Christ out to people. But I have some specific ones I can pray for. I have some folks, I'm looking right back there, the Bennett's were here in our missions conference, the Schmitz, we have a place ready for their letter. We have the Browns right over there, the Decunias who were here, the Doors who were here, others, we know them. Be specific in prayer. You have a need, be specific. Specifically pray, systematically study and read the Bible. Third is church. And I just want to give you some practical things. You, you cannot have a Christian who's decided to ignore church 
and church attendance and then watch them thrive in their Christian life. And I want to give you some practical aspects of that. One would be our church, our church family. Now, we're meeting differently. And I know I have some that on occasion I enjoy watching. One, they're biblical, they're sound in their doctrine. And those can be good. But I'm going to tell you, other programs and other things should not be replacing church in our life. We need to, to tonight, as we watch this, we're gathering. And I've heard of some, they have 10 and 12 people meeting at their home to watch these. Four and five. Some of you, you're by yourself. But you know you're never alone when you know the Lord. The Lord is with you there. But you're watching this. We are gathered separately, but gathered together. And you need the strength of your church. 11 o'clock, 6 o'clock on Sunday. Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. Some of the other programs and things could be fine. But gather together as a church, though we meet separately. Then I would tell you this, when it comes to church, gather as a family. Mom and dad, don't, don't let the, the kids, uh, that their spiritual enrichment is just going to be the missionary story. That, that's fine. The missionary story is good. I'm, asked, I'm the one who asked for us to do it. The object lesson or the teen talk that we do, those have their place. They're supplemental. Nothing, nothing replaces the preaching of the Word of God. I would advise you, even from their youngest ages, have the boys and girls gather on the couch, gather at the table, watch it together, talk about the message, go over it. Why? We need church. The first moment I heard that we were going to be going through this, I'm a lot like you. My heart broke in the fact that I can't see you personally. But we can gather and we can rejoice in the Word of God and the work of the Spirit of God. Gather as a whole family. But then the Bible says always abound. And then it says, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This isn't vain. That word is empty. This is full of promise, full of commitment, full of sacrifice, full of encouragement, full of caution, full of conviction. But the Word of God is full of what we need, and the work of God is full of what we need for victory. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. An odd time, yes. You might even call this a weird time in our history. Whatever word you choose, it's different. But we can abound just as we've had the opportunity to abound in the past. We can abound in a unique circumstance as God blesses us and we follow his word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word this evening, just breaking down that wonderful verse of Scripture, a Bible study together that would help us grow in the word together. I pray your blessing upon your church family. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you greatly. We will see you back in your place Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. God bless you.